Tonight on America's Dumbest Criminals, watch as a convenience store counter spontaneously becomes a firework stand. Discover what true pride of ownership means as you meet a crackpot with a crack pipe. And what in blazes are these guys doing what they're doing where they're doing it? Witness the witless as we extinguish the myth that crime is glamorous on America's Dumbest Criminals. Welcome your hosts for ABC, Daniel Butler and Debbie Allen. Debbie, 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 everywhere I go, people ask me the same question. Is it, don't you have some place that you need to be? No, no, that's the <laughs> second question. No, the first one is, where do you get these crazy stories? Yeah, or are these stories for real? I get that one a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the answer to the first question is everywhere. We get our stories from newspapers, from the internet, from letters and email, but mostly from talking to police officers all across the country. If you've got a story you want to pass along, grab a pen and paper. We'll give you our address at the end of the show. And the answer to the second question is yes, all our stories are for real. Yeah. We thought you might like to go behind the scenes of America's Dumbest Criminals. And after the tour, we'd like to invite you to stop by our gift shop for souvenir t-shirts and postcards. <laughs> Possible. We use actual video footage, like what you're about to see. We take you to Ocala, Florida, to find a dimwit who, with the flip of a switch, goes from a shadowy, anonymous burglar to an easy-to-identify suspect. Thanks to his indispensable help, he was caught on camera. Well, we had a local high school that was reporting that it had a, a bunch of thefts occurring. So what the school resource officer did was asked us if we would put a surveillance camera into the school. So we put it in there. The only problem is we kind of figured out that most of the thefts were going on after hours. One night, the, uh, the thief breaks into the school, breaks into the office, and we see this silhouette come in on the uh, surveillance film. And we weren't able to tell who it was until the thief turned on the light and revealed himself to us. <laughs> When Al Gore single-handedly created the internet... Oh, and I'm also fond of his other great inventions like penicillin, <laughs> a better mousetrap, and sliced bread. <laughs> he inadvertently created new ways for people to get into trouble. We've come across a story about a high school student who went from... You've got mail. To... You've got jail. <laughs> I wonder if Al envisioned that his creation would provide a story for something to remember me by. Take a look. I was uh, referred to a case about a juvenile who uh, had uh, harassed a teacher via the internet. The juvenile went into the school's internet and uh, pulled up a picture of this teacher and, and cut his face out of that picture. He attached this to a picture that he had gotten off of a pornographic website and he re-emailed the picture back to the teacher and ten other teachers and he was traced back to him through his email address which was attached to the picture he sent to the teachers. Little did he know that uh, email has your own email address attached to it, and that's basically how he was caught. Has since completed his terms. He's actually a pretty decent kid. I don't know, what's this world coming to? You know, once upon a time, criminals took pride in their work. They dressed well, they had nice haircuts. They wanted to leave the scene without a trace, you know? These days, they leave a lot more behind than fingerprints. If you need proof, we've got plenty of evidence left behind by crooks who were much better at stealing cars than covering their tracks. See for yourself. Officers were called to a car accident. A car hit a tree. When they got there, no one was around. They did find out that the car was stolen, though, and inside the car was a video camera. 
proud thieves had videotaped themselves. Real, real stories of gangsters. All right. All now right, we're back. Now what car do we pick? Up. Uh, the club. You can't jack a car with the club. Breaking into cars. This is a jack ride, if, if you can't tell. Our key is a screwdriver. Where's the key at? No, no. We're rolling. We're rolling like gangsters. Yeah, you know it. And if we get caught, Ronnie, you're eating the tape. Eating the tape. <laughs> um, stealing the car that they were in. That is a car that we're going to jack. Get away. It's already done, fool. We'll get another one. Oh, getting another one. We're back. What's up? Show me right here. What's up? What's Look. up? What's up? Look, I'm driving the G. Look at that. It's a G-Ride. What's up? G-Ride. Right. G-Ride. 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 We're pretty bored right now, so we're just looking for somewhere to go. The last thing that was on the videotape was... Oh, In police work, we always try and get the community involved in apprehending criminals. Usually it's the innocent citizens that we try and get involved, but hey, if the bad guys want to help us out too, we're more than happy to get their assistance. In Newport, Rhode Island, it's illegal to smoke a pipe after sunset. If the druggie you're about to meet had lived in Rhode Island, he'd have been in trouble on a nightly basis. You see, when officers cracked down on crack users in Alliance, Ohio, they thought they had hard evidence against one suspect. But he proved them wrong and right in a single action. It'll all make sense as you watch America's Dumbest Excuses. One evening, uh, we're responding to a report of a suspicious person outside a uh, residential area. Uh, by the time we get there, we realize uh, this is a, uh, a veteran of uh, several break-ins, and uh, he's a crack addict, uh, which a lot of our burglars are. We know him. Uh, he knows us. Uh, as soon as he sees me, I hear something, a little ting. I see he dropped a crack pipe, and it's laying on the ground, and it's right at its feet. No, I didn't drop anything. I heard it hit the ground. I saw it come out of your hand. I didn't drop anything. What's that right there? Come on level with me. You know, I, I saw you drop it. I heard it hit the ground. It's right at your feet. That's not your crack no, pipe. No, no, that's not my crack pipe. Look. This is my pipe right here. And arrest for possession of drug paraphernalia. Two counts. <laughs> Have you ever heard anyone say, there must be a logical explanation? Well, that's what they want you to believe. They want you to believe that nine out of 10 doctors recommend things. That Dick Clark can look that youthful by just exercising and eating right. <laughs> and that the Spice Girls could really sell that many records. Come on, get real. So go ahead, look for your logical explanation in our blue light special tonight, dedicated to Oliver Stone. And remember, the truth is out there. It occurred in an ordinary convenience store, characterized by a worker there as... Nice and calm. They always are, before Armageddon ensues, as revealed by the three surveillance cameras. I was gonna get a pop, and then I came up there, and I just saw it on fire. A careless flick, a pyro getting his jollies, maybe sparks from the Red Hot smoked sausage or hot dogs. The middle world was on fire, and then they just started catching on fire. And I'm sure there's no significance to that. I was kind of shocked to see how high the flames were going and just the, the way they exploded and the flames shot out. Like a fireball from an alien thrust rocket? A lot of people believe that somebody had to have been messing with them because it was too freaky of a thing that just start by itself. Like maybe time travelers or the FBI. I think they probably sat on the counter in the sun too long, and the window might have acted like a magnifying glass. Sure, sure, that makes perfect sense. If you discount the markings left on the counter are a perfect map to the lost city of Atlantis. At any rate, a man from a neighboring business quickly extinguished the flames, and aside from some singed fuzzy dice and some lotto cards that now read auto, order had been restored. So we'll never really know what happened unless they try to make contact again. We can only hope. Uh, had 
we keep a crook from getting away? Well, a couple of police officers in Daytona Beach, Florida, know the answer is found where the rubber meets the road. See what they mean. We're on patrol one night, and uh, we hear another officer um, gets involved in a, a car chase for a stolen car. We move into the area, and eventually we end up being the lead car in the chase. The guy driving the stolen car bails out of the car. He stops the car. He, jumps out and he runs back towards the police car. He's gonna run on us. So right away we recognize this guy. He's a notorious car thief in the area and uh, this guy runs like a gazelle. Well he runs back towards the police car he's still driving forward right. and he hits the, the front passenger side of the, of the vehicle. Next thing we know we're getting this deer in the headlight look staring at us right through the windshield. He just stops right there as the police car stops he stops. So I undo my belt, bail out, tackle this guy well, I only weigh about a buck fifty, maybe a buck seventy with the belt on. So uh, when I hit somebody and try and take them down, it usually takes more than one time. This kid went right down, no problem, which was a surprise to me. He comes around the car, came grabs in, hold I of him. I came out and I jumped on him, holding him down, and, uh, and I went after the number two guy in the car. Exactly. And I'm trying to roll this guy over, and I'm thinking, you know, geez, this guy is not rolling over. And I looked down, and I was like, God, oh, geez. And by that time, Lance is walking back over to us, and. I looked up, I said, Lance, I said, Back the car up. Back the car up. What do you want me to Just back, back the car up. Why, I, I'm arguing, why do you want me to back the car up? Just back the car up. I'm so I go around, I look. <laughs> <laughs> I'll back the car. So I put it in reverse and backed it up a few feet. And we found out why. Yeah, it turns out that the reason he stopped running when the police car stopped rolling is because the tips of his toes were caught underneath the front tire. We load him up in the back of the car, and, uh, and we, we can't contain ourselves anymore. No, we're, we're laughing so hard, and I'm, tears are coming out of my eyes. And eventually, this kid starts laughing with us. So there's the three of us, yeah. two cops and, and the suspect in the back of the car, just dying laughing over this. <laughs> And he's saying, oh, yeah, you got, you got me. me. You, got you guys me. got me. <laughs> it was great. It was. <laughs> and now the news that sits like an oily film on the surface of humanity. Here's Daniel with ABC Headlines. It's hard to know who to trust these days. When a woman realized that she had been conned into driving the getaway car for a friend's bank heist, she pulled over and told little Ma Barker to hit the road. Now, desperate for another ride, the robber began waving at drivers, her hands filled with wads of cash. Well, yeah, a not-so-good Samaritan stopped and tried to wrestle the recently acquired loot from her. Finally, both the bank robber and the bank robber's robber were arrested. Say that 10 times. To show the perils of drunk driving, a radio disc jockey in Seattle attempted to drive at varying levels of intoxication on an obstacle course set up by police officers at a remote location. Just as the seriously sauced DJ was about to conduct one final test run, a car zoomed onto the course, passed a stop sign, knocked traffic cones in all directions, and drove on. When overtaken by an officer a few blocks away, test indicated the driver was far drunker than the DJ conducting the test. <laughs> Thanks for that living, breathing object lesson. Okay. A teenage girl in LA didn't think she needed a disguise to keep from being identified while robbing banks. Why? Because she wore a see-through blouse with no bra. <laughs> Believing that it would distract attention from her face. Aha, uh -huh, but... She was wrong, and she was flat busted. <laughs> and that closes the file on ABC headlines. News ripped from somewhere near the back of your local newspaper. Debbie? <laughs> story of a modern-day Cheech and Chong who were convinced they were tripping out when they headed to the woods to fire up and thought that they were being fired upon. It's all rolled up in tonight's special delivery. We have a, a police firing range. It has a dirt road that runs uptown. It's well-marked police firing range. When they were running firing range practice, Well, these two guys drive up there in a car, park on the street, and sit down and start smoking a couple joints. One of our officers has to leave the firing range in a real hurry. She goes driving down the firing range road, and here are these two guys parked, doing their drugs, smoking their dope. The officer gets out, 
walks up to the car. <laughs> and then it's all history from there. For you to fully appreciate the situation you're about to see, a little background information would be helpful. In years gone by, officers referred to the legal paperwork related to automobile ownership and operation collectively as licenses, plural. That may sound like needless exposition, but trust me, you'll thank me as we take a little drive to Chickasaw, Alabama. We had a sergeant uh, who retired several years ago, and he was uh, getting on in age, and he had a nice pot belly, and he was real slow talking and that he never got in a hurry. He was always slow talking. He pulled over a person, uh, a woman, for a traffic violation. He said, ma'am, show them to me. And she lifted up her shirt, showed them to him. <laughs> he wanted her driver's license. Now, let's look back at one of ABC's greatest hits. Let's see if we can understand the logic of this next blister brain. You're driving along in your van, and a cop pulls up behind you, signaling you to pull over. Having a guilty conscience for one reason or another, you immediately feel the need to flee. Already, we see a flaw in this plan. So, here we have the scene from the dash-mounted camera of the pursuing officer. Our logicless loser is heading up the road with all haste, but wait, here comes the brainwave. Why don't I just turn left here and drive into my ex-girlfriend's place? <laughs> Literally. What was he thinking? Fortunately, no one was injured. And the good thing about public detention is you get lots of time to ponder life's little twists and turns and head-on collisions. In Virginia, spitting out a seagull is not tolerated. I was on routine patrol, just driving down the road, and there was truck parked beside the roadway. And I was on the passenger side, there was a guy underneath it working on it. So I pulled up behind him and walked up beside the truck. And I noticed he was making lots of motions from under the truck inside. What this guy had done, he was hauling a load of dope, marijuana, and he had it inside of a gas tank. Well, he had put gas in the wrong tank. He had dual tanks. And by mistake, he had put the gas in the gas tank that his marijuana was in. And he just pulled over to the side of the road and was trying to save the load. Well, he'd take kilos out of the gas tank and set them up on the floorboard. And as he pulled out, set one up on top of the floorboard, I just took it from him and said, thank you. <laughs> There's 140 pounds of marijuana. If you've ever had reason to visit an emergency room, you know that they practically bury you with paperwork before they scope out your problem. Yeah, you know, I've always wondered how your mother's maiden name could be responsible for appendicitis. <laughs> You know? Our last story tonight shows what happens when a guy on the lam takes full disclosure too far for his own good. If you don't believe us, just ask the Deputy First Class, Gwen Jones. She'll tell you, we're not making this up. This gentleman escaped from the jail, and he got away. Within a few hours of that, he showed up at the hospital and they asked him to fill out the paperwork necessary before treatment. And there is a slot on the paperwork that asks, how did you sustain this injury? And he wrote in, I hurt my foot while escaping from jail. <laughs> Needless to say, that was the end of his flight of freedom. That was pretty dumb. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. But we'll be back next week. If you've got a lead on a story you'd like us to investigate, visit our website at www.dumbcrimes.com. Or if you're more of the old-fashioned type, write us at this address, America's Dumbest Criminals, 3201 Dickerson Pike, Nashville, Tennessee, 37207. Who knows? We just might send our motley crew to your town. No, 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 no. You shouldn't threaten people like that. <laughs> Don't do that. Before we go, we want to thank all the officers who helped with tonight's show. Law enforcement is often a thankless job, but we want to go on record as being in your corner. As always, we hope that we've all learned from others' mistakes. But if you haven't, we just might see you next week on America's Dumbest Criminals. Goodbye. Goodbye.